everyone, my name is Melissa. And I'm Debbie, and we want to say welcome to Coast Hills. We have two exciting things coming up, and we want you to be sure to save the date. On Sunday, December 11th, we're having the best Christmas party ever. All is bright. It's everything you love about Christmas in one afternoon. We did this last year, and it was so much fun. We're bringing it back. You will want to invite all of your friends and neighbors because it's going to be the bestest, Christmasiest family event ever. 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 In May of 2017, we're going to Israel. Coast Hills is partnering with Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa for an amazing 14-day trip to Israel. You can find out more about this in the lobby or on our website. Deb, do you remember staff doing 100 tables? Yes, I do. It was so much fun having all of you into our homes, and now we know that that's what you're doing. So we want to hear stories. We want to see pictures. We've gotten a couple of them, but we need more. And I need you to send them to Gina Stockton. For more information about upcoming events or programs, see our website. And if you're new with us or need prayer or would like to sign up to receive emails, please fill out the Connect portion on the bulletin and drop it into the offering or at the Connect space. We hope you have a great Sunday and a great week. Good morning. Hello. You guys can stand up with us as we read from the word. Psalm 145 says, I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. I will extol you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and exalt your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom.
sacrifice with these hands. Let's lift our hands up. These hands lifted high. Hear my song. Hear my cry. I will bring a sacrifice. Here we go. Let's cry.
Well, Lord, we praise you that your love never gives up. We praise you that it never runs out, that it never fails. That that is the one thing that remains, your love for us. And together this morning, we gather to celebrate and proclaim that truth that your love never gives up. We thank you. And it's in your son's name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Well, good to see you this morning, 11 o'clock. How you guys doing? All right now. All right. All right. You guys can grab a seat for a second. It's so good that you are here. We're excited that you've uh, joined us this morning. You're actually here on a special day. Um, This morning... We all get to participate in something together, not just church, but more than that, we get to participate in child dedications. And we have two families that are dedicating. Yeah, you can, you can clap. Let's do it. All right. Yeah. Children. Nice. Um, yeah, so we have two families that are dedicating their kids at this service this morning. We had three families dedicate their kids at, at first service. So it's just, it's just so exciting to see these families make this commitment. And, uh, you know, when you make this commitment to dedicate back to God the gift that he's given you, you know, it, 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 it is exactly that. To say, God, you have given me a gift of a child, and now I give it back to you. Early in the book of, of Genesis, in chapter 4, When Eve gives birth to Cain, she says, with the help of God, I've brought forth a man. Right? And later in the book of Proverbs, it says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he grows old, he will not depart. And that's what these families are doing. They're recognizing the gift that God has given them, their children. And they're dedicating themselves to each other and to God and to all of us as community to say, We will raise this child in the way of the Lord. And the cool thing is, it's not just their their act up here. It's we all get to participate in that together. Because in community, we get to encourage them and help them and hold them accountable. So you can can give them a hug and say hi and just don't even ask if they're tired. Because they probably are. All right? And we get to participate in that together as a community to take these little hearts and these little minds and raise them up to know that Jesus loves them. And like we just sang, that his love never fails. So Pastor Chet's going to come on up with us. And I'm going to welcome the first family. The Wileys are going to join us. So give it up for the Wileys. All right, they're making their way up. They got their Sunday best on. I like it. All right, you guys, we got to clap one more time. Come on. What's up, buddy? Boom. Knuckles. You got to explode. Knuckles, explosion. There we go. All right, well, this is Tim. Tim, would you introduce your family to us really quick? Sure, this is my, my wife, Betsy, my son, my oldest son, Noah, and my youngest son, Eli. Right, and we're dedicating Eli today. The cuffs on his jeans are like so cool on the inside. I want a pair of those. Tell us why you're excited to dedicate Eli today. Well, just because, uh, first of all, he's a blessing to us. And um, just as much as he's a blessing from God, uh, God's a very important part of our lives. And our church family is an important part of our lives as well as our family. So... It's, uh, we need your help and your prayer um, just to try to bring him up as best as we know how. So There you go. There you go. Cool, cool. So I, I'd like to see if Eli has anything to say. Okay. Yeah, there we we're go. Shaking yeah, we're shaking hands. Up, give you a on? hug. Okay. Tell you I love you. All right, Eli, what would you like to say? Can you tell some, every, what would you like to say? Why don't you start for him? No? Oh, everyone's going to hide behind mom, huh? Go ahead, Eli. What would you like to say? Is your, do you have a, a grandma or a grandpa here? Do you have any family? Huh? Where, where's your family? Can you show me where your family's at? Where are they? Well, there's the family. All right, you guys, let's give it up for their family. So glad you guys are here. Well, mom, dad, here's what we're going to do. Would you guys just let's lay hands on Eli and let's ask the Lord to bless him. Church, would you just raise your hand and lift your hand? Is it just a symbolic way to say we're with you? Uh, Father, we come before you, and we're so thankful for Eli. And we're just so grateful that you have blessed this family with an incredible son. Lord, we know his name uplifted. 
We know your heart. And your heart, Lord, is when we were burdened, when we look up to you, you lift us up from miry clays. And so, Lord, we pray that Eli truly would be a man of God. We pray, Father, that he would love you with all of his heart and that his mom and his dad would just bless him with all the knowledge of God. We pray that Eli would follow you faithfully all of his days. We ask you, Jesus, that he would be a mighty man of God. We pray you'd fill him with your, your spirit from his very early age, and that he'd be able to memorize scripture, know scripture, and live scripture. Thank you for this family. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Guys. Would you give a hand, one more hand to the Wileys? Thank you, buddy. Come on. Hey. And we're going to welcome the yeah. Preston family on up. All right. Wow. All right, can I hold her? Let's there's, see what happens. I have Sunday. nine, so I'm safe. Come here. Hi. Hi. Come here. Oh, hi. Oh, my goodness. Everyone's got to see this dress. All right. Mom, help me out here. Let's make this dress as wonderful as it could be. <laughs> you guys, huh? <laughs> okay. Do the beauty wave. Do the beauty wave. Beauty wave. Huh? My goodness. All wow. right. Well, Sean, would you introduce us to your family really quick? I'm Sean. This is my fiance, Chelsea. And then this is our lovely little Scarlett. Awesome. Uh, tell us what you're excited about dedicating Scarlett today. We're here. We're just, just to give thanks to, to God for giving us the most perfect blessing that we could ever ask for. And um, uh, just to raise, me and her have decided to raise her, putting God first. And um, just to give as much thanks as we, as we possibly can. Amen. Amen. Oh, let's Amen. get close to mom. She wants to be close to mom. All right, here we go. Can I hold her? Sure. All right, good. Vic, hold your hands. Huh? Nothing. Yeah, what do you want? Would you like to say something? Huh? <laughs> huh? Well, who is this? Huh? <laughs> hey, church, once again, would you just lift your hands as we just pray for this precious child? Lord, thank you for Scarlett. Because we know through her you're already doing a good work. And you want to use this precious child to continue to do good works in her own family and around the world. Her name, a vision of God. And Lord, I know when you give us vision, it's to do great things. And so I pray that she would be a woman of God. That she'd love you with all of her heart and all of her soul, mind, and strength. And that this new family would raise her in the fear and admonition of God. I pray, Jesus, that you would use her at school, at play, that she would shine as a light. Lord, scarlet, red, what a reflection of the blood of Jesus. It was shed for us that we might be saved. And I pray that she would bring many boys and girls, men and women, to Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Here you go, Mom. All right. Thank you, Prestons. Thank you guys very much. Hey, guys. Great to see you guys this afternoon. I would like, if you would, would you please welcome Zach Patterson to the stage with me? Zach has come on board as one of the assistant pastors here at Coast Hills Church. And we're just very, very thankful. In fact, we were in an elders meeting earlier this morning. And one of our elders said, um, he, he, yeah, it was wonderful what he said. He goes, well, we hired Zach and Chet came with him. Um, and then said, no, no, one of the elders said, no, 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 that's not true. We hired Zach and Chet's wife and Chet came with them. <laughs> Uh, but I'm thankful he's here. Zach has been with me for almost six years. Um, he is the overseer director of our school of discipleship called Patmos. Um, and man, we're just glad that you're here. Yeah, it's, it's great to be here. So great to be here with you and great to be here with you guys. I'm very thankful, you know, just as these families are coming up, I have a family. And I'm very grateful that we can call Coast Hills our church home and that my family has a place and a people that we can call our family. Amen. So, Amen. yeah, it's a blessing. And, you know, here at Coast Hills, 
we believe in fellowship. And so as you see the families coming up and us praying over them, we believe in fellowship. And so we're gonna take a few minutes and we're gonna fellowship with one another. And in this time of fellowship, we're also gonna pray because we believe in the power of prayer. Yeah, and this week, listen, it's another week for us to pray for our nation. We see everything that's going on around our nation. And remember what we said last week, it's God speaking to his people. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, then I will hear them and heal their land. And so this is your opportunity. Because we believe in fellowship as worship and we believe in prayer as worship, would you just stand out, welcome someone, greet them, and then just pray with them and pray for our nation. God bless you guys. Christ alone, the cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. So Stone, weak made strong in 
the Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. Christ beautiful sound. Um, we're going to step into this next time of offering. And um, this morning, I just, I have felt reminded over and over again that I think this morning is a moment where God wants to sit with each and every one of you, that he wants to simply be in your presence and ask you to be in his, that he wants to sit in the seat next to you, regardless of if there's a person there or not, you can just sit through them. <laughs> he wants to sit right next to you and he wants to be with you this morning. So we're going to invite the ushers forward. And we're going to give of our offerings and we're going to give of our mind. We're going to give of our heart right now. And we're going to allow God to move this morning in every way that he can. So, Lord, we give you this space. We give you this space next to us, in front of us, behind us, God. Would you just encircle us and encamp around us? Lord, would you give us your protection and would you give us your grace and your love right now? Lord, I pray that you would wash over every person in this room. Lord, I pray that our offerings to you would be sweet, that they'd be blessed and multiplied. God, would you multiply them in your favor. Lord, we love you, and we now give back to you what is yours. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can have it all, Lord. Every part of my world. Take this heart and breathe on this heart that is now yours. You can have it all, Lord. Every part of my world. Take this life and breathe on. This heart that is now yours. All the joy I found surrendering my crowns. The feet of the king who surrendered. Together now let's sing. There is no greater call than giving you my all. I lay it all down. I lay it all down. There is no greater love, no higher name above. I lay it all down. I lay
Receive our praise now on this altar. You are our God, we are your children now. Oh, break down the walls that live inside us. Speak to the places we need revival, God. Let your kingdom come, God. Let your will be done, God, in our church now. Sing songs over us, God, through your word now. Because we are looking for you, we are longing for your presence. Meet us here, meet us now. So God, we look for you, we long for you, we desire you, we gather because of you, we respond because of you, you alone are God, all of the other things we tend to make God are not, it's you that is God. And so we cast all of those things aside, and we count it all as loss for the great gain of knowing you. We let go, and we hold you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You're good. In Jesus' name. Amen. Before you have your seat, would you grab your Bible and stand with me and open to Philippians chapter 3 as we honor God and his word. Philippians chapter 3. And if you don't have a Bible in hand, have your phone. You can download the YouVersion app. Uh, go to Philippians chapter 3 as well. We're going to start in verse 20. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. For our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Our Father, we stand before you in worship and the word because we stand with you and stand for you. Lord, we stand before you because you're our God, King of kings and Lord of lords. And today we worship you and we honor you and we honor your word and we ask that your word would go forth in power and your word would change our lives. Thank you for this church. Thank you for these people. Would you be glorified? In Jesus' name, all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please, if you would, have your seat. As we continue our study in Philippians chapter 3, last week we had the opportunity to learn we're on Team Jesus. If you're taking note, the title of this message, we're citizens of heaven. Citizens of heaven. Now, I don't know if you know what that means. Maybe we'll define it for you today. But every country has a culture. 
and citizens of that country, well, they follow that culture. Listen to this definition of culture. A culture is a way of life of a group of people. Their values, attitudes, beliefs, and symbols that they've accepted generally without thinking about them and that are passed along by communication and imitation from one generation to the next. Now, I don't know if you know this, but I'm a Bahamian man. I'm all the way from the Bahamas man. That's my culture. That's where I'm from. When I came to the United States of America, I had to learn this, that, and the other because TH wouldn't come out my mouth. And I went through speech therapy so I could learn how to talk like you people. You see, understand, as a Bahamian, there's some similarities of our culture and there's some differences of our culture. You see, our values as Bahamians, well, it's family. It's conch, conch fritters, fried fish. We are people of the sea. I'm a spear fisherman. I don't understand why you guys have turkey for Thanksgiving. All it does is put you to sleep. Fish, brain food. It's my values. My attitude? Oh, it's the national motto of the Bahamas. No problem, man. No problem. Let me tell you, no problem sometimes is good for you. Sometimes it ain't so good for you. Because when you're calling your mechanic and he hasn't showed up to the garage, he says, no problem. No problem. It's the attitude of the Bahamian people, but the belief Oh, the belief of the Bahamian people. Now, I can crack on my own Bahamian people because I'm Bahamian, but don't you follow suit. Listen, the Bahamians, we believe it's better in the Bahamas. And so we believe here is the Bahamas and here's the rest of the world because it's better in the Bahamas. This is my culture, my values, my attitude, my beliefs. And as a citizen of the Bahamas, I didn't know that anyone did anything different until I left the Bahamas, moved to the United States, and all of a sudden I realized one of these things is not like the other. The environment was a little bit different, a lot different than my own. In fact, I had a little culture shock. I had a little experience that was like, wow, I'm definitely in a different place. I'll never forget when Andre and I moved to Africa. I'll never forget the first dinner that we went to. And there we were, and we're all excited for this particular dinner that's on its way, and out comes a smoked iguana. A smoked iguana. I don't know if you've ever eaten smoked iguana. It's not tasty. But then so lovingly, what they did was turn the iguana over, cut it in its stomach, pulled out the eggs, and said, these are for you. Culture shock. <laughs> so I said, no thank you. Not knowing that in that culture, no thank you means, no, thank you. Like, please give me more. <laughs> out came another iguana. No, thank you. Okay, you know, it's just like iguana after iguana. They're like, finally, we're out of lizards, man. Listen, and not only would I experience culture shock, well, I think I shocked them with my culture. I'll never forget. I was teaching a sermon, and I was teaching this sermon, and the power of God was there. I don't know the power. Listen, and I said to them, can you believe that was just stupid? And the whole congregation went, <gasps> like this. And I go, wow, that was impact. So I said, can you believe that was just stupid? I said it again, that's just the stupidest thing. And every time I said it, it was like a slap in the face and it was just like coming at them like this. Well, I thought, wow, great impact. I'm on my way home and an elder of our church came to me and he said, um, none of us can believe that you use the S word in church today. <laughs> the S word? That's the stupidest thing I ever heard. I would never use the S word in church. <laughs> You see, I didn't know that word's a really bad word. Culture shock. Well, I'd like to shock you a little bit this morning. Would you please welcome to the stage a very good friend of mine, Carlos, and another friend, Lorena. Please welcome to the stage. I've known Carlos for the last uh, four years. He's from El Salvador. In fact, our church, with the generous gift, is going to be working with uh, those that are in El Salvador. And we brought him here as we we're getting ready to introduce the generous gift. But I know him from Patmos, which is our school of discipleship uh, that we've, and you heard me say that Zach oversees, and he's been a part of that. It's uh, about 11 years old at this point. In fact, our Patmos class just got back from El Salvador. Would you guys stand so that they can? And see who you are, where you're at. 
Go ahead, stand up, you guys. Can have your seat. Well, Carlos was a part of a class three years ago. He left El Salvador, came to the United States of America, talk about culture shock. And so, Carlos, could you please tell me, what did you experience when you went from, came from El Salvador to the United States of America? Sí, uh, buenos días. Es un placer para mí estar acá. Pastor Chet es como mi pastor y también como mi padre. Uh, good morning. It's a pleasure for me to be here. Pastor Chet's like my pastor and my father. Uh, bueno, sí, pasé un gran choque cultural y lo primero fue el inglés. Uh, my first culture shock was English. Yo simplemente, <laughs> <laughs> yo simplemente quería seguir al Señor y le dije, okay, ¿a dónde me vas a llevar? I, I just simply wanted to follow the Lord and I just didn't know where he was going to send me. Y en eso él me llamó a Patmos, un lugar donde todo es en inglés. And he sent me to Patmos where everything's in English. Entonces yo le dije, Dios, te quiero seguir, te quiero entender. Uh, Lord, I want to follow you, I want to understand you. Entonces luego me empecé a dar cuenta de que Tenía que leer en inglés, tenía que memorizar en inglés, tenía que cantar en inglés, tenía que hacer todo en inglés. And then I realized I had to learn my verses in English, read my Bible in English, read my books in English, read, sing in English. I had to do everything in English. Entonces le dije a Dios, ¿acaso tú eres inglés? And I asked the Lord, are you English? <laughs> uh, y, y luego entendí. And then I understood. Él, él me dijo, bueno, yo, yo puedo hacer hablar incluso a los burros. I, I, the Lord, can even make the donkeys speak. Pero cuando yo los hago hablar, ellos hablan lo que yo digo que hablen. But when I ask them to speak, I tell them what to say. Mm, amen. Well, Carlos, actually, his father is the pastor of one of the largest churches in Central America. It's a church of about 5,000 people. And Carlos just spoke at that church, at his father's church, last weekend. So he did the Sunday services. His dad came over here. Um, and he went through our school discipleship. It was a four-month school, an opportunity to just get into God's word. Um, Carlos, how did Patmos prepare you? How did Pat Patmos change your life? ¿Cómo fue que Patmos um, te cambió tu vida? ¿Cómo fue que te preparó? Sí, en ese momento yo estaba muy humillado. Um, when uh, I went there, I was um, humbled. Y... Yo quería seguir a Dios, quería hacer cosas por él, pero no sentía que sabía cómo. Um, I wanted to serve the Lord, I wanted to follow him, but I didn't know how to. Entonces, me empecé a dar cuenta que era porque yo no tenía una relación con él. And then I started to notice that it was because I didn't actually have a relationship. No tenía intimidad con él. I did not have intimacy with him. Y cuando nosotros no tenemos intimidad o una relación con una persona, when we uh, don't have a relationship or intimacy with another person. No confiamos en ellos y si nos dicen, vení conmigo a la casa, vamos a estar como, no, no, no te conozco. Um, and then if we, if we have this relationship, we don't have trust in the other person. So if the person asks me to come over to their house and spend time, I'm kind of, I don't know, I don't really don't know you. Entonces Dios me alejó de todo para que yo tuviera una relación con mi Dios. And so the Lord took me away from everything I knew so I could have a relationship with him. Y así, yo iba a confiar en él para ir donde sea que él quisiera, cuando sea, por lo que sea. And with that, I can trust him um, to know that I can follow him wherever he sends me and whenever he sends me. You know, it's incredible. Carlos went back to his church, and the church just had this major revival. He's leading the young adult ministry, the youth ministry. He's teaching in the school. Uh, he's 21 years old, just rocking it for the Lord Jesus Christ, and just so excited about what God is doing in his life. Uh, and I'm also excited about what God's doing in our life. Here's the church. Um, you guys, our culture, we're generous givers, and that's why we're calling this Christmas series The Generous Gift, and we're going to be partnering with El Salvador, and we're going to be helping bring kids joy through Christmas. And so kids that are in need, we're going to be giving them joy this Christmas, partnering with El Salvador. And I want to ask Carlos, Carlos, how will our partnership in the generous gift, how does that help you advance the gospel? Many times Jesus teaches deeply. <laughs> oh. <laughs> By the way, I speak English. Hablo <laughs> inglés. Um, <laughs> So many times Jesus uh, used uh, material things 
to teach deep, really spiritual things. Muchas veces el Señor usa las cosas materiales <laughs> para enseñar las cosas espirituales. And one of those things is to give. Y una de esas cosas es dar. And you guys are giving to children in El Salvador that they don't have attention, attention or love in their homes. Ustedes están dando un regalo a niños en El Salvador que no tienen atención y amor de sus padres. So imagine when that child received that gift. Entonces imagínense cuando ese ese niño o niña recibe ese regalo. A person that don't even know him is giving me this. Una persona que ni lo conocen me está dando un regalo. So there must be a God that wants to give me attention and love. Entonces hay un Dios que quiere darme atención y amor. And that's expressing a, a spiritual thing through material things. Amen. Amen. Let's give it up for Lorena and Carla. Thanks, guys. Thank you. That's the culture of our church. You see, at our core of our DNA, that's why we're entitling this series coming up, The Generous Gift, this Christmas season. Would you watch this video and figure out how you can get involved with The Generous Gift? Hey everyone, Karen, can you believe it's Christmas time? Well, this Christmas, like every Christmas, it's a time to celebrate that God sent us the most generous gift of all, His Son, Jesus Christ. This gift of love compels us to love and care for others. And so our generous gift is to bring joy to children in need, both locally and globally this Christmas. Well, as a church, we're going to be asking you to join us in three specific ways. First, locally by identifying, nominating, and adopting a family in need. Yes, we are asking all life group, men's groups, women's, young adults, family life groups to prayerfully consider adopting and bringing Christmas to family in need. Karen, that's right. Our hope is that everyone will be involved in our church. But number two, we're going to be partnering with Pastor Jorge, who you met last Sunday, and he's planning a church and a school and a clinic in El Salvador. Jorge has given us a list of items that would immediately impact and bless this impoverished community, like new and gently used shoes. And we have an opportunity to bring joy to the children in El Salvador by providing toys, school supplies, and hygiene items as simple as a toothbrush and some toothpaste. When you arrived this morning, you might have noticed the collection bins in the lobby. Let's get them filled up. Finally, remember I told you there's three ways. You can help financially support the generous gift and other opportunities to make an impact in God's kingdom through your generous gift. Maybe you can't give your time, but you can give something of your finances. Hmm. Thank you for joining us this Christmas as we bring joy to children in need. Please go to our website to find out more information and the need to get involved. And remember, our desire to give back comes from the generous gift we received in Jesus. That's the culture of our church. That's what it means as the part of the DNA of who we are. And what the Holy Spirit wants to do in Philippians chapter 3 is express the culture of a citizen of heaven. Now, if anyone would understand what it means to not be in your home, but yet act like you're in your home, it would have been Philippi. If you remember, Philippi was a colony of Rome. It was a Rome away from Rome. It was a way for Romans to expand the kingdom without using their military strength. Let me explain what would happen, kind of like a, cent a century village. After you served the army for 21 years, you could retire. And what they would do with these retirees is they would send them out to Roman colonies, much like Philippi, and create a Rome away from Rome to expand the kingdom of Rome without doing it with military strength. And so Paul writes the church and he says, in the same way, you're a citizen of heaven. And I know you're not in heaven like a Rome away from Rome, but you are a citizen of heaven. No wonder Jesus began the parables like this. The kingdom of heaven is like. We are currently today living in God's spiritual kingdom right now. 
And Paul would write the church in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and he would say, you're an ambassador. You've been given the ministry of reconciliation. Peter would say, you're strangers here. You're pilgrims. You're simply just passing through. And because we're citizens of heaven, there's a value about us. There's certain attitudes about who we are. In fact, because we're citizens of the kingdom, there's certain belief systems that we should have as citizens. And Paul in Philippians chapter 3, he's going to describe to us what are our values, our attitudes, and beliefs as part of being a citizen of heaven. Would you look at verse 1 of chapter 3? Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Now, Paul is typical of every preacher. He says finally, and he's got another 20 minutes to go. So he says, finally, my brethren, speaking to the church, rejoice in the Lord because one of the greatest values of heaven is to rejoice. One of the greatest values of heaven is to rejoice. In fact, the church, it's Revelation chapter 4 and 5. And we've been raptured out and we're now up in heaven. And the Bible says that we experience a worship service, worshiping Jesus for seven years. This incredible worship service. Well, as all of heaven is rejoicing and all of heaven, all of earth is facing almost like hell on earth through the tribulation. No, we get to worship Jesus. Well, Jesus is someone to worship. Jesus is someone to rejoice about, even in the Philippian letter. Paul describes for us something of Jesus that we can be confident of this, that he who began a good work in us will complete it. That's something to worship Jesus about. We can change. He says in Philippians chapter 2, we've been consoled, we've been comforted by the fact that we're saved by Jesus. He says we've been accepted, accepted in the fellowship by the Spirit. He says in this very same book that God has affectionately and mercifully poured out his love on us and forgiven us. Jesus is someone to rejoice about. But Paul knows we have an enemy. He knows we have an enemy that wants to rob our joy, steal, kill, and destroy. And he says in Philippians chapter 3, for me to write to you the same things, for you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Paul knew there was an enemy, and he doesn't want the enemy to rob us from our joy, so he wants to repeat to them an earlier instruction so that he can protect them. You know, parents, what I'm talking about. It's every night you saying to your children, brush your teeth. Next night, brush your teeth. Brush your teeth. And then the boys, oh, they just walk into the bathroom. I don't want to brush my... Okay, then let your teeth rot out of your mouth. No, that's not what we're going to do because they don't pay the dentist bill when they get all the cavities. And so we constantly over and over as parents have to say, brush your teeth. Brush your teeth. Brush your teeth. Because we're trying to protect them from the pain of a cavity. And Paul is doing the same thing. He doesn't want any cavities in the church. He doesn't want any decay in the church. And so what he does is repeats the information as a warning. And he says in verse 2, beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. Now, this is a letter to the church at Coast Hills, and any time the Holy Spirit tells us, beware, 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 we had better beware of dogs. Now, I told you that I'm from the Bahamas, and the Bahamas has a problem in, the, in Nassau. We have a, a, a breed of dogs known as potcakes, and they roam around the island. In fact, there's an estimated number of 50,000 dogs on an island that's only 7 by 21. And no matter where you go, you will see these mangy mutts all over the island. And when you see one, back away from it. You don't want it to come near you and stare at it like you're angry at it. Because if it sees that you're afraid, it's coming after you. But you don't want this dog to bite you. If it does, you're going to get sick. And Paul says, beware of the dogs. Beware of those that have a false doctrine that if they infect you, it's going to make you sick. It's going to decay you. These are the Judaizers. These are beware of the evil workers. The evil workers? You see, the evil workers, and what he's talking about is the fact that Jesus Christ died on the cross. 
and each one of us can be saved. And Paul would go into a church and he would explain the joy of salvation. And when Paul would leave, the Judaizers would come in. And they would have big smiles on their faces and flowing robes. They looked all religious and they said, what Paul said was great, but you've got to do some stuff. You have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this. And if you don't do that, well, then you are definitely not saved. These are the legalists. These are the people that make Christianity look like we are moral police instead of the grace givers that God has given us. You see, these are the false doctrine people that say that our religion, our Christianity, our faith, well, Jesus was good, but you have to do this in order to get to heaven. It's just not true. And I don't care how much of a smile they have on their face, Paul calls them evil workers. He says, beware of the mutilation. You see, this is another word for circumcision. Beware of those that want to cut your flesh. Beware of those, he says, that want you to go the way of Judaism instead of receive simply the wonderful gift of the grace of Jesus. And those that receive that gift, he says in verse 3, for we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. We are the circumcision. Remember, God gave Abraham the sign of the covenant, and it was circumcision. And with that covenant, he was an heir of the promise. And with that covenant, he was the chosen people. And now Paul says, you are the circumcision who've decided to receive the grace of Jesus Christ. Cut away the flesh and live in the spirit. No longer are you responsible for the law. Jesus fulfilled the law and you can worship God in the spirit. You don't have to depend on your good works anymore. You don't have to do this or do that. No, it just flows out of you in the spirit. We're Worship God in the spirit. He says rejoice in Jesus. This word rejoice, it means I can boast in Jesus Christ. I can explain all the wonderful things that Jesus has done. That he died on a cross. That he saved me from my sin. I don't want to boast in what I've done. I'm embarrassed of what I've done. I needed Jesus in order to save me. And I don't want to be a Pharisee. You remember the story. It's in Luke chapter 18. Pharisee gets up at the temple, he's got his long robe, and they just look ridiculous. I mean, they got the big old box on their head called a phylactery, wrapped their arms with leather. They came walking in like this, and the Pharisee says, Dear God, I'm so thankful I'm not like that person. And I'm grateful that I tithe. I'm grateful that I do all these wonderful things. And the tax collector, he's over there. Oh, God, forgive me. And Jesus says, he, the tax collector, left with God. He, the Pharisee, did not. He wanted to boast in himself. What do I have to boast about? I want to boast in Jesus. In fact, Paul says, dare I boast of anything except Jesus Christ and him crucified? Dare I talk about any other thing? But he says, have no confidence in the flesh. I don't know about you, but I know who I am. I know what I've done. I ain't got no confidence in my flesh. Now, if your flesh has ever failed you, please raise your hand. If your flesh has ever failed, okay, time out, time out, time out. If you didn't raise your hand, you're a liar, so it just failed you. So what I'd like for you to do, go ahead and raise your hand if you have failed in your flesh. Go ahead, raise your hand if you failed in your flesh. Now keep your hand up, keep your hand up. Now listen, it's why we sing the song. Keep your hand up. Listen, it's why we sing the song, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound That Saved a Bunch of Wretches Like You People. <laughs> Someone put their hand down. Listen, saved a wretch like me. I don't have any confidence in my flesh. I know what I've done. I needed a savior because I couldn't live the perfect life, but Jesus lived the perfect life for me. This was culture shock to the Judaizers. They couldn't believe it. They didn't grow up in this. They didn't know what he was talking about. Paul, he knew exactly where they were at. Take a look, if you would, at chapter 3, verse 4. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth day 
of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. In other words, I'm the real deal, man. My mom, my dad, everyone in my line is Jewish. I come from a kingly line. Remember Saul, my name is, was even after him. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin, the only faithful tribe. Listen, I'm a Jew. He says a Pharisee, if we continue on in the scripture, concerning the law, a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, I persecuted the church. Concerning the righteousness which is in the law, it was blameless. But what things were, circle this word, gain to me, what was valuable to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. These I've counted loss for Christ. Paul got it. He got it on the road to Damascus. And he realized that there was nothing that he could do. And the culture shock of Damascus, he realized that Jesus Christ was King of kings and Lord of lords. And there was no way that this murderer could do anything to attain salvation. But all he could do was receive the gift of Jesus. You see, Paul, he was trying to find his value in his job. He was trying to find his value in his position, in his pedigree. He was trying to find his value where he lived. In the Americas, maybe we want to call it keeping up with the Joneses. And he was trying to find his value in what he did and who he was, but he realized that his true value as a citizen of heaven was Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. He says in verse 8, would you look with me yet indeed? Because I found my value in Jesus, he says, yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, parenthetically, I say, as if he could have anyway, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. The righteousness which is from God by faith. Did you read that? It's our value. We're a citizen of heaven. Our value is the excellence of the knowledge of Jesus. Knowledge. Now, I need to help you understand this word knowledge. And we're going to go all the way back to Genesis to understand this word. And Adam knew his wife Eve and she conceived. This word knowledge, it's an intimate word. This word, knowledge, it's a relational word. And what Paul is saying is, you can know Christ. You can have a personal relationship with God, with the God of the universe. That is incredible news, so incredible. He says it's excellent. And if you're taking note, that word excellent, it means superior. There is nothing better than to know that Jesus Christ died for you. Now, if you don't believe that, then you don't understand how excellent it is to know Christ. He's better than any other thing. Someone in the church say amen. Amen. Okay, that was a little weak on the amen part. He's superior. And he says the way that you can enter into this relationship is by faith in Jesus. That's it. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to climb any hill. You don't have to pay penance. You don't even have to go through purgatory. He says the only way, well, I've been to some third world countries that I thought was purgatory, but here's the understanding. The only way that you can receive this gift is by faith in Jesus Christ. To know that he came to earth, that he lived a perfect life because he knew we couldn't. That he died on a cross and he paid the price of my sin, but he didn't stay dead. He rose again on the third day. He has victory over death and he says, come to me and I will give you rest. That is the belief in Jesus. No wonder citizens of Jesus boast about him. No wonder citizens of heaven boast about who he is. He's the hero of heaven. Now, I don't know who's your favorite sport, and I don't know who's your favorite player, but it always blows my mind when I see you on your specific game day coming into church, wearing your jersey with your number and someone else's uh, last name on your back. It blows my mind. It blows my mind so much because, let me tell you something, you're being marketed, man. That's why these players have sponsors, because they know we're so smart that whatever they wear, we'll buy. 
So they buy their shoes, they buy their jeans, buy, they buy their jerseys, and everywhere you'll see just this little, uh, little Nike thing that's up like this, you could buy the same pair of shoes at Target, but you'll buy $80 pair of Nike shoes because he wears it, because she wears it, because they've got that suit on and they've got that jersey on. Well, let me tell you something. Jesus is the hero of heaven. And he says, would you look at what Paul says? Philippians chapter 3, as the hero of heaven, Paul values his Savior so much. Would you look at verse 10? He says this, that I may know him. There is his salvation and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Paul says, as my hero, I'm going to wear whatever he's wearing. I'm going to say whatever he's saying. I'm going to do whatever he's doing. He's my hero. We call this sanctification. When we get more and more and more like God. And let me tell you what Paul is saying. No matter what it costs me to get rid of my sin, I'll do it. No matter the suffering that I have to go through, no matter if i got to suffer my flesh, I know that Jesus, by the power of the resurrection, will help me be able to say no to sin. I'm going to do whatever it takes because I want to be a part of the resurrection of the dead. You see, I call this the attitude of a citizen of heaven. It's the attitude of gratitude. It's the attitude of gratitude. See, Paul knew something about himself. He says it here in verse 12, not that I've already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Jesus, Jesus laid hold of me. In fact, the Bible says in 1 John chapter 4 that I know what love is because he first loved me. Now, let me describe the kind of laid hold that he's talking about. I go to Zach's house. We drive to work together every single day. And I stand at the door and I knock. And he's got two little boys, three and two years old. And I can hear them pouncing over to the door and they know what's about to happen. And as I'm knocking at the door, they open the door very carefully. And as soon as they see me, I go <laughs> like this. And I start shaking and they start shaking. And then they start running away. And guess what I do? I run after them and I lay hold of them and I hold them and I tickle them. And let me tell you something. It's a great experience. The Bible says Jesus stands at the door and knocks. And we tiptoe over to the door. And we think when we open the door, Jesus is on the other side going, I'm going to get you. No, he's not. He's on the other side of the door going, <laughs> open the door. I can't wait. And as soon as we open the door, he runs to us and he grabs us and he holds us. And he says, I love you. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. I suffered and died for you. Of course I love you. I'm not out to get you. I'm out to get you. I'm out to lay hold of you. I love you so much. I died for you. And he's reaching out to us the same way. Don't harden your heart. Don't walk away from the door. Christian, if you're listening to me, you know that you're in sin and he's knocking at your heart's door. He's not out to get you. He's trying to protect you. Brush your teeth. Brush your teeth. Brush your teeth. I don't want you to be decaying. I don't want any rottenness, any cavities in your mouth. I'm only knocking at the door. I'm only giving you this instruction because I love you and I want to protect you. That's my attitude. Look at verse 13. Brethren, I don't count myself to have apprehended. In other words, I know I've got a road. I've got a journey to walk. But one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. You see, I want you to underline something in verse 13, but one thing I do. One thing. It's one focus I have. And my attitude as a citizen is to focus on one thing, the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. My job is to keep my eyes in heaven. My job is to keep my eyes on Jesus. And Paul tells us how we do this. He says, listen, church, forget the things that are behind. Forget them. You can't change them. They are what they are. You did it. Point your finger at yourself and say, I'm a loser. That's what your flesh is. You did it. You can't change it. But here's the hope of heaven. 
He says, forget those things that are behind. He says, listen, Proverbs chapter 24, though a righteous man falls seven times, he gets back up again. And let me tell you why he gets back up again, because Jesus is knocking on the door. Come on, open the door. As soon as you do, I'm going to grab you. I'm going to hug you. I'm going to tell you I love you and squeeze you and tickle you and tell you that you're just great. It's what Jesus does. So Paul says, if you want to keep your eyes on the upward call, you can't live in your failure. You've got to learn from it. You've got to get back up again. Forget those things that are behind. Listen, Christians, God has the only divine prerogative of forgetting our sin and remembering them no more. Paul is not saying we won't remember it anymore. Paul is saying learn from it. And then he says, reach upward, reach onward to the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And he explains what this reaching forward means in verse 15. Look with me in verse 15. Therefore, let us, as many as the mature, have this mind. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us be of the same mind. Here's what Paul is saying. Trust God to mature your faith. Trust God to teach you how to become more like Christ. And you may not be there now, but as we learn the word of God together, you have an opportunity with what you've learned to apply it to your life today. Brush your teeth. Brush your teeth. And God will continue to send the warning. He'll continue to say, beware. He'll continue to do this because he wants to protect us. Your job is simply to apply what you've learned today. Now, Paul, he gives us two examples. He helps us understand through a human perspective a good example, and he helps us understand through a bad example. Take a look first at the good example in verse 17 of what it means to pursue the upward call of Christ Jesus. Brethren, he says, speaking to the church, Join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. Paul uses himself. He says, follow me as I follow Christ. Paul is our good example because let me tell you about Paul. He was passionate about change. He was passionate about being conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. Do you remember when Paul and Barnabas got in a fight? You guys remember? They got in a little fight over John Mark. And they divided ways. Imagine if the Bible read like this. And Paul and Barnabas got into a huge fight. So Paul took out a knife and stabbed Barnabas in his uh, uh, chest. Well, Chet, that's a little graphic. It's who Paul was. He was a murderer. He was an angry man. He was there when Stephen was stoned and they were putting their coats at Saul's feet who became Paul as he stood there approving the death of a human being. That, Paul says, I'm passionate about change. I know what my flesh is and I'm going to do everything I can because Paul knew who he was. In Romans chapter 7, he says, why do I do the things I don't want to do? And why don't I do the things that I know I should do? And he asks himself a question, who can rescue me? And then he says in the last verse of Romans chapter 7, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, my Lord. He knew that the only way that he could be rescued from flesh was to live in the spirit, receiving the gift of Jesus. But let me tell you, church, we've got to be honest. You've got to recognize the areas of your life that need to be changed. And maybe it comes across even today like a little culture shock. Well, I didn't know I had to change. Well, if we're a citizen of heaven, then we're going to have the values of heaven. We're going to have the belief of heaven. We're going to have the attitude of heaven. And sometimes that comes across like culture shock. But let me tell you, there's benefits to being a citizen of heaven. And God says, I want you to be with me. And maybe it might come across as culture shock, but it's better for you to change and know that God is protecting you because he gives a bad example. He gives us a bad example. Paul's our good example, desperate for change. Take a look at our bad example. For many walk, of whom I've told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they're enemies of the cross of Christ. In other words, they're not saved whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. 
These are the people that say, I don't want to change. I, I like satisfying my flesh, feeding my belly everything I want. When it's hungry, I feed it. Little. In fact, when, it, when I'm really hungry, I get hangry. I'm angry and hang hungry all at the same time. I'm just hangry because my flesh controls me. He says, these are the people that talk about their sin publicly, and they let everybody know, yes, I'm in sin, but God loves me. That's not a citizen of heaven. If I know that God loves me and he gave his life for me, then I'm going to do everything I can to be more like the Savior who saved me. You see, these guys, they're only living for today. They're not living for tomorrow. They're not citizens of heaven. No, they want to be who they are, but not a citizen of heaven. Paul says very clearly in verse 20, our citizenship's in heaven, from which we also eagerly, in other words, I'm giving it everything I got, wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. We've got values. We've got attitudes. We've got beliefs. Let me tell you what I believe. I believe I will be changed. And this lowly body, this smelly, stinky body here on earth, I know one day when I look at Jesus Christ in the face, in heaven, as a citizen of heaven, I'm going to be like him. That's what the Bible promises me. It's 1 John chapter 3. He makes it very clear in 1 John chapter 3 that when we see him, we will be like him. And then he says in verse 3, and everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. You see, belief affects my behavior. And if I know that I'm going to be a citizen of heaven and that I'm going to take this lowly body and turn it into a resurrected body, then I'm doing everything I can today to be the citizen I know that I should be. And here's the beautiful part. It's by his power that I'll do it. So Paul ends this letter and says, Therefore, my beloved and longed for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. Let me tell you what Paul's saying. What you learn today, what you learn today, stand fast in it. Put it into practice today, this moment. Choose to change that's a citizen of heaven. Would you pray with me? Our Father, we come before you, and we ask in the name of Jesus, would you use your word to help us change? Charles Wesley, the great theologian, hymn writer, he says this, change from glory into glory till in heaven we take our place. Till we cast our crowns before thee, lost in wonder, love, and praise. Church, I'd like for you to be in prayer. And as with our first service, we saw someone come to the Lord. You're asking yourself, wait a second, I'm not a citizen of heaven. Well, let me tell you something. I left the Bahamas. I said goodbye to my citizenship there, and I came to the Americas. And I became a citizen. Now, let me tell you what instigated that. I travel all over the world. There are no Bahamian embassies anywhere in the world. And when I would get into trouble, nobody would take me. I went to the American embassy. Sorry, you're not American. I went to the Germany embassy. Sorry, you're not German. I went to the Brazilian embassy. Sorry, you're not Brazilian. Let me tell you something. There's great benefits about being an American. And I decided to forsake my citizenship in the Bahamas and become an American because of the benefits. Let me tell you something. There are great benefits about being a citizen of heaven. You just have to forsake being a citizen of the world. That's it. So now I'm speaking to you. Jesus Christ died for you. And there are so many, there's hundreds of people in this church who believe that. And your heart's beating right now. That's what's happening because you know I'm speaking to you because you want to be a citizen. You want all the benefits of heaven that Jesus died for you, knowing you couldn't live the perfect life. So he did it for you, and then he paid the price, and he says, all he says is, come to me. That's it. And earlier, at 9 o'clock, a young man, a 20-year-old guy, he stood up back here, and he's like, I want Jesus. 
and he became a citizen. You're not joining our church. You're joining heaven, man. And the benefits are out of this world. If you want Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord, Jesus called his disciples publicly. I'm going to ask you to stand right where you're at. Now, here's why I'm asking you to stand. You're amongst friends. Because as soon as you stand, this church is going to erupt in praise to God because we know what being a citizen is all about. And if you would like to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord and pray a prayer of faith with us, you're not joining our church. Would you just stand right where you're at and say, Chet, that's me. I want Jesus. I'm just going to give you a moment because I was the guy sitting there that knew I needed to stand and I didn't. Don't believe the lie of the enemy. Being a citizen and being a citizen of heaven, man, the benefits are great. I just want to give it a moment longer. Is there anyone that would say, I want Jesus. Church, you be in prayer. So Lord, we pray that you would motivate our church to seek and to save the lost. That our seats would be filled with our friends that need to hear the everlasting gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand in worship? I'll be back in a moment. together now. joy now. Come on.
we're going to sing it out together about how great, how strong our God is. for this man and this group. Let's just thank the Lord for them. Amen. This is a, a, an opportunity in our service to Selah. It's a word in the Psalms. It means to stop, pause, think for just a moment. We've been memorizing scripture. We've been going through Philippians together. This week, Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. You remember it. In humility, count others better than your... Wow, you're much better than the 9 o'clock service. <laughs> this week, it's Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. Just a piece of that verse for our citizenship is in heaven. And we want to encourage you to read through Philippians chapter 3 this week. Memorize this scripture for our citizenship is in heaven. Now remember, pray for us this Wednesday, full house. Phil Wickham will be here. And if you've got your tickets... So thankful for that. But as well, we're going to give you a way to get involved with the generous gift. Make sure you get a little sheet of paper that says how you can be engaged and involved with the generous gift this Christmas. And remember, Israel's seats are still available. We've only got 50 spots. Myself, uh, I'm going to be leading the tour. I'm excited about going. It's in this May. Make sure you get your spot. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful Sunday.